the safeguards really has two meanings. There's international safeguards, which relate to monitoring and verification activities pursued by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And there are also domestic safeguards. And the term domestic safeguards in the US nomenclature refers to the physical protection of and uh, materials accountancy for domestic facilities. Um, I think generally we're talking about international IEA safeguards. And, and in that context, it refers to the whole of the activities pursued by the IEA to ensure a state is fulfilling its obligation under um, the non-proliferation treaty, or in certain cases, um, few, a safeguards agreement separate from the non-proliferation treaty. Um, so the regime has evolved um, over um, the years. Um, and uh, the most significant expansion was in uh, the 1990s after the revelations of North Korea and Iraq and activities that I, I didn't know about. And so, I mean, early on, safeguards just dealt with um, monitoring and verifying declared um, production and nuclear material activities at a facility. And after the non-proliferation treaty was um, agreed and signed by a broad range of treaty safeguards generally became known as what are called full scope safeguards. That is the activities across the state to ensure that the nuclear material as declared um, is accurate. And, and, and again, over time, things have happened in the international community that has led to a recognition that um, more um, intensive and broader efforts are needed and this is why the 1990s, um, beginning in 1993, the IEA and member states negotiated a new agreement called the Additional Protocol, which added on to these basic material measurement activities and sealing and looking at things in reactor cores um, and, and began adding a much greater effort to look at undeclared activities. And so, so the scope now is quite broad but it hasn't always been that way. And it's been made broader again because of revelations which told the international community that the safeguard system wasn't strong enough, in particular as it relates to undeclared activities. Um, so the additional protocol again, which was the, the additional set of measures, allows the, agencies to, the agency to understand in much more detail what a state is doing include at, the, at declared safeguard facilities and at research institutions and what the state intends to do in the future also. And it gives the agency not only more information about the state, but also additional rights um, to um, pursue activities at sites, including undeclared sites. Safeguards are intended to detect the diversion, potential diversion of nuclear materials by a state, by the state that's controlling it. Um, and to ensure that the state's declaration is um, both accurate and, and comprehensive, that is not, not including anything. So the, if you want to call them the old style safeguards, the core of safeguards is at facilities. So for example, you have a nuclear reactor and you want to make sure that the state is not diverting um, fuel from a nuclear reactor, that, that they're operating, that the state or a company within the state is operating. And so you pursue a number of activities um, accounting for, or well, the state accounts for the material and the agency needs to verify that that accountant's accounting is right. And that includes applying seals in certain cases to ensure when the agency is not there, the material um, hasn't moved. So when they come back, it's the way it was before. Um, cameras, radiation detectors, radiation sans sensors, sometimes, you know, even weighing things. You want to make sure that fuel assemblies are not um, fake. Um, and so there are a broad range of these sorts of activities at nuclear facilities um, that um, have been pursued basically since um, the creation of safeguards uh, and, and the IEA. And again, the newer safeguards, additional protocol, those sorts of activities are at a much wider range of facilities, including things that don't, aren't directly related to production um, of nuclear material. So for example, facilities that might be involved in producing uh, precursors or equipment that could be used um, in a nuclear fuel cycle or a university, a lot of um, what's called complementary access, which are the inspections under the additional protocol are universities 
because, you know, say a state declares it's not doing any uranium extraction research, and then the IEA finds that, ah, oh, here's a publication from Carnegie Mellon, you know, doing, you know, exactly that, and they haven't declared it. And so the agency can say, well, we want to know what you're doing. And um, if the answer isn't adequate, they can ask for complementary access, that is, in a sense, an inspection to, to see what you're doing, to see if it's consistent with what the state has declared. States are sovereign, and so the states that are subject to these inspections and complementary access are the countries that have signed the relevant agreements. Um, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which most countries have signed, um, a few haven't, um, um, it is, um, you know, obligates states to accept the agency safeguards, and that's interpreted to mean what I refer to as the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, the Basic Safeguards Agreement. The additional protocol um, is, um, again, a much newer agreement. It has a smaller number of signatories. Um, it's still quite large and growing, and the goal, I believe, of, our, of the U.S. government and many governments is universal application. Um, but a couple of least important countries, um, you know, ha have not yet signed. Uh, so, so the country has signed the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, and I don't know, two-thirds-ish, half, maybe two-thirds have signed the additional protocol. But the additional protocol is additional to the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. So would they fit together? Uh, well, you know, you're right. I mean, that's the way countries look at things, what's in it for them. You know, there, there are really two things in my mind. The most obvious is, you know, there, there's an implicit um, and at times explicit um, deal within the NPT that, that countries will agree not to pursue nuclear weapons development and in a sense, in exchange, they get some general confirmation that they will have access to nuclear um, technology. Um, there's been arguments over the years of exactly what that means. And some countries, um, for example, take it to mean we have a right to what are called sensitive nuclear technologies, enrichment and um, uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. And other countries, such as ours, say, you know, no, that's not what it means. Um, and you know, so, so there are differences in interpretation. So that's kind of the what's in it for me. But there's also, I think, a much, or I would say equally important element, which is why we have the NPT, that I, th I think many countries recognize that they're better off without a world crowded with nuclear weapons. That is, in order to prevent their neighbor from pursuing nuclear weapons, they have to agree not to. So there's a global and regional element too, and uh, you know, pure national security recognition of the benefit um, in that realm that affects countries' desire to sign up. And there's also, I think, a sort of peer pressure, universalization, you get to a, a global norm, um, it, it's important and it creates a, a pressure in itself to, to sign up, especially for countries that are far away from any realistic um, ability to achieve nuclear weapon status. Well, you've actually asked two different questions, so I'll try and answer them um, both. A lot of people see, in, the, in America in particular, see the IEA as um, the non-proliferation inspectors. Often in the press, they refer to them as the global watchdog. Um, the, the reality is, is the agency is made up of a number of key pillars, and safeguards is, is one of them. And I think to our perspective, prop, um, in our perspective, one of or the most important, but they also um, cooperate with developing countries in spreading nuclear technology, called the TC program, the Technical Cooperation Division. They establish global nuclear safety standards, which um, a good chunk of the world follows, um, and they establish guidelines for nuclear security, uh, and uh, also nuclear applications, that is non-energy applications such as radioactive sources, used in um, cancer therapy and things like that. So, so the, the, the agency itself is quite broad. And if you look at the original statute, I and mean, it's actually the statute that's still valid, um, there's a very heavy emphasis on safety, um, which, which I think probably hasn't come to fruition. There's some vision of, of global nuclear safety inspectors in a sense and global standards and, and safety and security for that matter has become seen as a much more um, national responsibility um, with, 
an important IEA role, but not, not nearly as central as, as you see it if you read through the statute. Um, but the one that we're focusing on and focus on much is the safeguards role. And the safeguards um, department and role has a staff, I don't know the numbers, um, a couple hundred, I would guess, maybe more, um, a couple hundred for inspectors. And you have teams that go out and inspect nuclear facilities, nuclear act activities. You have these inspectors that go and pursue complementary access. You have a large number of information analysts back at headquarters um, and a decision-making process because this doesn't all happen naturally on, and on its own. An organization has to make a decision. A, what information um, do we need? Um, there's information that's specified, of course, in the agreements, but um, where do we implement, where do we look, which complementary access um, facilities do we go to, um, you know, how frequently do inspections need to be, where should they be. Um, so there's a, a very large um, structure in Vienna, Austria, um, where I worked for a few years, not in the safeguards department, in the safety and security side, um, that, that does all these various functions, again, deciding where to go, how often to go, sending teams out to the field. And I think in a few countries like Japan, there are actually regional offices too, because there's so much travel, it just makes sense not to have them all back in Vienna, although the vast majority are in Vienna. It's a mixture um, of scientists and non-scientists. I mean, there are different skill sets that inspectors need. One of the courses we run at Brookhaven is to help the inspectors develop their capability to pursue complementary access. And that's not just technology, that's observation skills, um, you know, how you use different devices, when you should use them, do you spend too much time, you know, looking at your device as opposed to looking around you, are you asking the right questions, elicitation skills, since a lot of inspection is um, cooperative and you have to know how to get the best answers you need. How do you set up an inspection? What are your goals? So those, it's a wide variety of some technical, I don't know the percentage, half maybe, um, skills and um, general inspection, information analysis skills back at headquarters. And you know, it was very technology intensive, um, not just the technology of the devices they use in the field, but how you integrate the information that you've collected from the state over the web, from member states maybe, um, and how do you put that all in a format that lets you decide again what information you need and whether you have adequate information to conclude that a state um, is or maybe is not um, um, being honest in its declarations. Um, well, there are the technical challenges, which I think involve coordinating the support of member states. The IEA has both a regular budget that they collect from member states, and, as well as extra budgetary um, cooperation. I think one challenge is that technology is changing so quickly, whether it's you know machine learning or new detector materials. And I think there's a big challenge in how do we take advantage of this technology and not so much in the interest of any individual state that wants to give assistance, but in terms of the overall inspection. And that's not just, suggest that states are doing anything malicious. It's just that you know, everyone looks at things differently and, and it's not always easy to say, you know, what's the best technology, where should we focus? Um, so I, I think technology integration is a big challenge. Um, I think political support is a major challenge. I mean, the agency is much stronger than it was in its safeguards mission, say 20 years ago. Um, but I think over time that wanes, you know, every once in a while there, um, you know, there's a crisis and people get behind the agency and you make changes and give the agency through agreements, you know, new rights. And that hasn't really happened recently. And so I think, I think that's a, a, a challenge that, you know, as it becomes easier in a sense for states to acquire nuclear materials and different, a larger number of states sort of become more potential. I think the agency will need broader rights to be able to ensure the non-diversion and non-production of um, illicit nuclear materials. So generally, non-state actors are seen as um, a different issue. That is, non-state actors are generally in the security world, not the safeguards world. But, but as you're pointing to, I think there's an incredibly important overlap. And that is, 
while the safeguards regime is designed to prevent um, or detect, I should say, prevent by the threat of detection, the diversion by states, it also, the tools you use also are what's there to protect um, you for the state to protect against um, theft by non-state actors. So many of them. So for example, the safeguards regime, the core of it is that the state has to have a materials accountancy and control system. It has to know where its material is and has to report this to the agency. You know, same thing from a security perspective, when you're talking about non-state actors, the first thing you want is a state to be able to know where it's needed for material is to have an effective materials control and accountancy system. So there's, there's an important overlap, but the focus of the safeguard regime is keep detecting the state from diverting. And so the efforts by the state to prevent a non-state actor, a, a criminal group or, or a terrorist group from stealing um, is conceptually different. I think that, you know, over time, the relationship between the two will be recognized as being closer than people currently think about it now. And you might see a greater merging of the two, but right now they're, they're, they're separate, separable issues. Things are much looser. On the safeguard side, you have a, a core agreement, the NPT, where states have agreed to, in a sense, give up some degree of their sovereignty in order, to, in essence, to keep their neighboring states from acquiring nuclear weapons and to have access to uh, nuclear energy. Um, in the security world and the safety world, I'd say the agreements, especially the security world, are much less developed. And while the safeguards um, world is, uh, safeguards are seen implicitly, intrinsically rather, as an international responsibility. That is, they're implemented by the IA. Security is seen as a state responsibility. And the agency um, doesn't have authority unless a state requests to you know, inspect for security. There, there, are, there are missions that the agency does on a case-by-case -case basis when the state requests, but, but it's, it's again on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there is uh, an agreement called the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, which obligates um, states to protect their nuclear, nuclear material and do a number of other things, um, but it, it does not obligate the state to accept inspections in any way like the IEA. Maybe in the future there will be, but again, right now, that there's that fundamental distinction that safeguards are by definition international with a clear defined role for the IEA. Security is a national responsibility and the agency is there to you know, provide guidance, provide guide, guidelines, um, you know, help out. And um, so, you know, again, maybe over time, these will come closer, but um, right now there's a, it's, it's a fundamental separation. And safety, as distinct from security, although there's a lot of overlap between the two, I'd say is a little bit in between. That is, the physical protection convention I mentioned um, was just amended to apply to domestic nuclear material um, in, in use um, under the Obama administration, not, not not too long ago. In the safety world, there's been an international agreement, the Nuclear Safety Convention, for, for quite some time. Um, in the safety world, I mentioned earlier, the IA statute is um, surprisingly, if you know people who who operate with the IA now, if they if they go back and read it, it's surprisingly focused on safety. It's sort of been the safety statutes have been um, uh, part of the agency from the beginning. They're considered legally binding on the agency and the projects the agencies are involved in. So therefore, the states that are implementing projects with the IEA have to follow the safety standards, or at least for those projects. And so, so they're kind of a little bit, I don't know, if you had security in terms of one in, ter in terms of the international role and safeguards at 10, you know, you'd find safety at three or four in terms of their the international responsibility. Although again, um, safety also is considered a national responsibility. And so, and so we, we have here some national um, responsibilities and activities and we have uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the global or international uh, cooperation and coordination efforts, largely within the AEA. But we also have some 
uh, bilateral or minilateral arrangements or initiatives. I'm thinking here of things like uh, U.S. Soviet, uh, U.S. Russian cooperation after the end of the Cold War to secure loose nukes, and I'm thinking here of the PSI. Can Can you talk a little bit more about some of these um, U.S.-led or U.S.-directed efforts that are smaller in scope but still international in nature, mm -hmm. um, at aimed at safeguards and, and security? Well, it's actually. What you're pointing to are, are typically bilateral or smaller multilateral or organizations or structures um, that relate to specific topics. That is, they generally stay away from safeguards. And, and that's again because um, the IEA role in safeguards are, are so, so dominant. And also, you know, safeguards have existed for a long time. So there are clear structures. With the fall of the Soviet Union, concern about the illicit trafficking in nuclear material, former Soviet material in particular, there, there were a number of new initiatives to help deal with that specific problem, or or things related to, to it, illicit trafficking potentially. Um, and so there were, I don't think there have been any new ones under the current administration, but in particular in the 90s. Um, in early 2000s, there were a number of, you know, as you mentioned, the Proliferation Security Initiative, PSI, a lot of initials floating around. Th these are generally, um, I, I think they reflect the fact that in the nuclear security area, um, structures were much less developed. So you didn't have like this one, you know, area where obviously if something happens in the non-proliferation world, you know, a safeguards world, people are gonna look to the agency and say, what do you need? So they reflect that, but they also reflect the fact that some things are better done with a fewer number of countries. So um, I, I can remember a particular document related to nuclear security where it would have been a little bit difficult to negotiate this within the IEA because there's so many countries and it wouldn't have been impossible, but it would. And so it was, um, negotiated among the P PSI countries. And I think it was PSI countries. And then, and then when it, all these, I forgot what number it was, 20 countries or whatever, agreed to it, then we went to the IEA and said, okay, here's some guidance that 20 countries have agreed to. Why don't we start there and see if, um, and so the small number of countries allows you to take what these, and generally they're the countries that know the most um, about the particular topic, and then, and then turn it over time into an IEA document, you know, when others, can come along and it's much easier to do things that way than to just jump in and say okay let's start now to you know create a document on this or that so that's another role for these smaller groupings of countries and sometimes of course you know administrations democratic and republic you know like to have initiatives and so you come up with things with a name and then, then you, um, you 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 figure out afterwards what it means <laughs> I was actually I remember being on an airplane I think it was after PSI was announced with the guy that was supposed to be in charge of it. We were going to Moscow for some reason, and um, and he we could, neither of us could sleep. And he pulled me aside. We're standing, and he says, "So you know, what do you think this PSI is?" And I'm thinking, "You're the person that's responsible for it, you know." So um, you know, there's a lot of and, and initiatives come and go, and some are good, and some are helpful, and some again are just headlines. I mean, it's good to have a forum. And so, for example, in a lot of my work when I was um, nuclear safety a uh, nuclear safety coordinator for State Department, um, and which transformed a little bit into security, um, it was easier when we had the G8 framework and the G8 or G7 at certain times summit coming up because you can use that to achieve good things. And I'm sure PSI, again, although I haven't followed it in you know two decade and a half, you know, is that way in a sense too. It gives, if they're, you know, good people with good ideas, a, a forum through which to push, you know, th their initiative. And um, it's a little bit lower, but I, I think things probably end up in the summits anyhow, so. We've, we've sort of forgotten about the urgency of the nuclear threat. And um, I mean, a lot of people obviously in the field have been, but you know, with COVID and politics and this and that, you know, we forget that we're not much safer than we were, you know, even during the Cold War, or, you know, certainly at the end of the Cold War. 
And I think there's a degree of urgency and um, flexibility on the part of a variety of governments um, to make the world safer from a, a nuclear perspective, to negotiate the next generation of agreements that will allow a higher level of confidence that we have now to ensure that nuclear materials um, not diverted. And it's only gonna get easier, I think, for terrorists or small states to acquire um, nuclear materials. And, you know, I think the technology goes, I, I don't see a solution, anything that will keep the technology from getting easier and easier over time. So I think, first of all, it's important to um, recognize that technology alone, or even sometimes in combination, can't solve the problem. Te technology is just a tool, detectors are just a tool, and better detectors will um, make things better probably, but but it has to fit together, as Eric mentioned earlier, with technical will. Um, in terms of technology though, uh, you know, you, you see, since I was in school and um, in order to identify nuclear material, identify what material it is, you, you actually um, needed big equipment. I mean, you'd be in a lab size of maybe this room or something, you know, and you needed, you know, the detector and oscilloscope, a big computer, um, and maybe if it was a germanium detector, you know, a big vat of um, uh, nitrogen. And um, so, so there was no way that individuals, especially individuals that weren't scientists or engineers, could even make use of it. And you've seen this revolution in my mind, in technology in the last three decades, in which you've gone from this discipline that only scientists with, again, stuff they couldn't carry could do, to a regime in which um, anyone can use a radiation detector, you know, after five minutes of training and use it to tell you what material it is, whether it's, you know, a risk or whether it's not a risk or whether it's nuclear material or whether it's dirty bomb material or, and, and, that, and that's a pretty big step that I'm not sure is always recognized. But when I begin to think, and, and that's in part because we've developed new detector materials, but probably the biggest one is just the miniaturization of electronics. Um, and when I think about like what's next, like in that technical area, I, I think it, it's the ability to the advanced algorithms, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, natural language processing to, to allow us to network hundreds and hundreds of detectors um, and take advantage of the information of that network as opposed to individual detectors. So, so you see one kind of revolution, and I think that sets the stage for the one we're sort of, I think, embarking on now, hopefully, where we have this you know, ubiquitous detection, which makes detection of nuclear materials, which really, you know, when you're talking about it, ports and things like that, you know, very difficult, maybe almost implausible in certain cases. Um, it makes it a lot more plausible or the idea of a, you know, a, a terrorist in a city with a nuclear bomb or a radioactive dirty bomb, you know, almost impossible if you are looking at individual detectors, but if you have thousands of integrated detectors going through a central processor with, um, with, with taking advantage of, of these advanced algorithms, anomaly detection algorithms and others, I, I think you you take it another step in ensuring security. And again, that's just from a technical perspective and technology can't solve problems alone. Um, but you know you need the political will to go along with that and the funding, of course. So so I think I mean, I know a lot of smart people who are involved in the field and are dedicating their careers to it. So I believe there's something to it. Um, again, the concept you're referring to, I believe, is these um, development of small modular reactor SMRs using what's called HALU fuel, um, high assay, low enriched fuel. I think as um, your students know, there's um, uranium can be enriched to a level which can be used in bombs or which a lower level, which is typically used in reactors up to 5%. These new reactors use something at the roughly 20% enrichment level. So. My, my overall um, impression is we'll have to see. I mean, I, I'm a little bit suspicious that building small reactors won't make economic sense, at least not for a long time. 
I mean, there's a reason we built bigger and bigger reactors and it's because it made more and more economic sense. And even that wasn't cheap enough. Um, I, I believe these reactors are, um, the proponents claim they're inherently safe. That is, they, many of them, that is, they cannot melt down and release large amounts of radioactive material. I mean, I, I believe that's true. And I believe that leads to, uh, or could be true, and that leads to some cost savings because there are a lot of things you don't need if you can actually demonstrate that you can't have a serious accident. But whether the economics, you know, reducing the, those protections balances out with the, the, um, the challenges, economic challenges of having small reactors. And of course, all these are, are new, they're, they're old concepts, but they're new designs that require new materials and new technologies. And so wait and see, we'll have to see. Um, the challenges are, of course, as I mentioned, that they're using higher enriched fuel, um, which helps on the safety side, um, but um, creates something we need to think about on the non-proliferation side. So in the US, when you're talking about safeguards and security, including support to the IEA, we have a fairly large laboratory structure with some of, as you know, the, the weapons laboratories like Los Alamos and Livermore and Sandia and some of the non-weapons laboratories like Orkaven, Ardon, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory that provide safeguard support to the US government that allows the US government to efficiently inform the IEA and sometimes directly to the IEA. Um, in terms of um, safeguards approaches, in terms of um, equipment that safeguards people may use. Um, and on the security side too, we provide advice and guidance. We participate in the IEA drafting of new guidelines for security and safety for that matter. Um, and so the national lab system, and there are other um, um, entities too that are comparable to the national lab systems. I think we're called federally funded research and development centers. And again, we think of the labs primarily, but there are a few other entities like that too. The US government, we all together provide support to the IEA and to the US government. Um, at Brookhaven, we, I think support, I don't know percentage wise, but largely NSA and their safeguards mission and also substantially the Department of State um, and, and their safeguards mission. We run what's called the International Safeguards Policy Office, which actually coordinates the direct requests from the IEA um, and gets US government approval and then tasks out to the work to the private sector and the other labs. Um, we also at Brookhaven do a lot of training and um, as a central part of that, for example, we created a textbook on nuclear safeguards and it's the only one of its time that includes a lot of people that were involved in the development of the modern safeguards regime and it's available on, on our website for um, free at this point. 